Welcome back to Dielectric Videos. On today's episode, we're going to be talking about power quality, specifically power quality in AC systems and its effect on switched mode power supplies like the ones you might find in computers or laptop chargers or phone chargers. Now the first thing I'm going to go over are some of the causes for low power quality. Now today I'm only going to be discussing the effects on single phase power in terms of voltage and the voltage waveform. I'm not going to be discussing power factor or three phase power quality issues, which power factor I've already done a video and three phase power deserves an entire discussion in its own right. So in terms of this single phase power, six main issues that I've highlighted here and shown some example like uh, hand sketched waveforms for are as follows. One issue is shifting frequency, where the actual uh, period of oscillation or frequency of, uh, of the output voltage changes with respect to time. And this can result in problems for some devices, particularly devices which rely on the AC frequency to operate at a specific speed, like induction motors, synchronous motors, and other similar devices. Waveform distortion is another problem. This can happen when too many uh, reactive loads with, say, rectifiers in them are connected to a circuit, and the, perhaps the tops of the waves get chopped, or perhaps due to the way that a, uh, an AC signal is generated, there could be ripples in the AC waveform itself, among other uh, waveform distortion issues. Another big problem can be voltage ripple, and this can be an especially big problem in situations where intermittent loads are connected to a circuit, or when the power supply or generator is unstable in its operating conditions. We'll go into this in more depth later. Momentary cutout is another potential problem. That's where for short periods of time, the signal goes to zero. This would be an example of what you might find when a loose connection is present or a bad switch contact is present in a circuit where it cuts in and out over and over again, leading to dead spots in the waveform. Another problem that's similar to voltage ripple, but somewhat more pronounced is voltage spiking. This can happen when there are large inductive loads on a circuit and they're suddenly switched off. That can lead to a sudden back EMF that raises the voltage substantially, and this can result in potential damage to electronics or equipment that is not well filtered. And the last type of uh, power uh, quality issue that I'll go into today is brownout, which is basically a condition where the normal operating voltage decreases substantially this can lead to erratic behavior, occasional overheating in motors, and can lead to electronics to intermittently turn off or potentially even cause hard disk crashes. But uh, we'll go into that when we start talking about how power supplies work, as well as what, uh, which ones of these are most problematic for switched mode power supplies. In order to give context to this discussion we're going to have today, I'm going to give a brief overview of how a modern switched mode power supply operates. And this should give you some intuition as to what types of power quality issues would be most problematic for such a supply. This is a 350 watt ATX power supply that's been mounted to a piece of wood. I use this as my sort of brute force power supply for my uh, electronics projects where I need a lot of current and not necessarily a whole lot of voltage accuracy. The reason for that being that the capacitors on the output side have, uh, have suffered from the capacitor plague. This power supply is from around 2006, and that was right in the heart of the time when counterfeit capacitors from China, many of them actually had a, uh, an incorrect electrolyte formula, which led to subsequent puffing and release of electrolyte over time, and many, many of them failed within the first year or so. And this power supply is still functional. The reason I'm using it on a uh, benchtop rather than in a computer is because of these capacitor issues. And in a future video, in fact, potentially my next video, I'm going to be replacing the bad capacitors. But for now, we'll just use this as a prototypical example of a switched mode power supply. So how does it work? We have AC power coming in, in this case at 120 volts AC. The input range rating for this power supply is 100 to 127 volts AC, and that allows for a substantial variation in the line voltage while still providing full output current and satisfactory voltage regulation at the output. Now once the AC power comes in, it's initially run through a fuse, and it's filtered via several common mode chokes, which are basically inductors with two windings on them, and these serve to remove high frequency switching noise from the line. 
that's an FCC requirement to make sure that the line, uh, line noise output of the power supply is minimal. There are also some small polyester film capacitors here. These serve to reduce the amount of line noise and to mildly correct for any power factor issues that arise from the common mode chokes and from subsequent processing of the signal. Now in addition, you'll see this small black disc here. This is an NTC thermistor or negative temperature uh, coefficient thermistor. And what this does is it serves to limit the inrush. When, uh, when it's cool, when its temperature is low, it has a relatively high uh, internal resistance, which limits the inrush of current into the power supply until it finally heats up, at which point its resistance decreases and as a result, the power supply begins to uh, can, per, can derive as much current as it needs to from the line. Now, once it's filtered adequately, the AC power is then fed to a rectifier. Now, this is a full bridge rectifier, just like any other. It'll be rated for between 4 and 5 amps, since this is a 350-watt power supply. And the bridge rectifier converts the AC signal from the input to a DC signal. And... Of course, that DC signal coming out of it is filled with ripple because the rectifier doesn't smooth the output. It only basically takes the absolute value of the AC signal and provides that as an output. That's where these two large electrolytic capacitors come in. These are connected such that the output of the rectifier is filtered so that you can get a smooth DC supply at whatever the peak voltage of the input supply is. Now, that's really important to note. If you have 100 volts going in, you're going to get about 1.4 times that because this is the RMS voltage coming in and the rectifier is going to take the absolute value and filter that, thus giving the peak voltage. So for 100 volts, the peak voltage would be about 141 volts. For 120 volts, it would be around 170 volts DC. So once it's filtered, we have this clean 170 volt DC rail available to the power supply. Next, a large switching transistor, which is controlled by an integrated circuit, uh, switches that very, very quickly at probably between 10 and 100 kilohertz through this large ferrite core transformer. Now, this large ferrite core transformer, which I'll flip around to show, is the main voltage decreasing element in the circuit. It's taking our main voltage from these capacitors and it's stepping it down to a lower voltage, which can be further processed later on. Now, since, since this is a ferrite core transformer, it operates best at very high frequencies, which is why we have that fast switching MOSFET under this heatsink, and it also can be much smaller for an equivalent size. If this were an iron core transformer, to provide 350 watts, it would have to be probably as big as this entire power supply, and of course, it would weigh probably 100 times as much as it. So that's the advantage of using fast switching in, in switch to one power supplies. An additional huge advantage that's going to be very relevant in our discussion of power quality is that switch mode power supplies can utilize negative feedback, or rather just feedback in general, via these devices, these little boxes here. Let me zoom that in. These little boxes are called opto-isolators. They're effectively a light emitting diode, an LED, inside a package with a phototransistor and it allows for electrical galvanic isolation between the two sides, but allows information to be communicated across between the secondary side and the primary side. Now what those do is they, they have a, there's a chip on this other side that measures the DC voltage at the output, and it then tells that opto-isolator whether to turn on or off depending on that voltage, and what that does is it tells the IC over here to switch this MOSFET with a greater or lesser duty cycle. Now by changing the duty cycle fed into this transformer, you can actually manipulate what its output voltage is on average. When, it, when the output of this gets rectified, it's filtered by another set of capacitors, which are these ones here, and that rectified signal allows for a great deal of variability in the actual DC output by changing the input duty cycle. This is why switch mode power supplies are amazing for their power regulation performance, even with noisy input power. Regardless of what the input conditions are, provided they're high enough to provide the necessary output current to the load, the output voltage will remain pretty much constant so long as the negative feedback is sufficient to keep this circuit operating uh, at the nominal output voltage. Now the last stage of the system is 
rectification, and final uh, voltage processing. Now, I believe the way this power supply derives its 5 volt and 3 volt rail are via boost or buck converters. So I believe what it does is it has a main 12 volt output from the rectifier from this transformer, and then it buck converts that to 5 volts and 3.3 volts using additional switching transistors mounted to this large heatsink. That may not be exactly accurate. There may be multiple taps on this transformer as well, but that is the main, the main idea is you have the output from this transformer, which is then further processed to the subsequent rails. Now here's where the faulty capacitors come in. These capacitors are the ones that filter the high frequency content out of that rectified signal from the transformer. And as a result of that exposure to high frequency, combined with the faulty uh, design of the capacitors, many of them have puffed and are probably no longer anywhere near their ideal tolerance for capacitance or their ideal tolerance for equivalent series resistance, or ESR. That being said, though, the power supply still does function adequately, and it's good enough to operate just kind of brute force loads like drills, power inverters, and basic circuits. So now that I've done a basic overview of the power supply itself, I'm going to go on to a discussion of how power quality affects these types of switch to mode power supplies. So we'll sequentially go through each of these uh, potential problems and determine what effect it would have, if any, on the performance of the power supply. We'll go with frequency shift first. In terms of all of these issues, frequency shift is probably the least concerning thing from the perspective of a switch to mode power supply. Because the input is rectified and filtered by these large capacitors, the line frequency going in really is not that important. It could be as low as these, as, as long as these capacitors can continue to provide that stable rail, the frequency can go quite low. I would say for a power supply designed for 50 to 60 hertz, it would probably operate satisfactorily down to around 40 hertz. Raising the frequency is even less problematic because provided it stays within the switching time of this rectifier, which is probably up to around a kilohertz, the frequency should not bother the power supply at all. And in fact, that's actually quite applicable because on many aircraft, a 400 hertz power line is uh, power rail is supplied. So theoretically, this power supply would operate perfectly fine on a 400 hertz airline power supply, just as it would on a 60 hertz mains power supply. The next one we'll go into is waveform distortion. Now this might have a slightly higher effect on the power supply if the peak waveforms, uh, the peak points in the waveform end up being too low or below the nominal, say, 170 volt peak for 120 volt uh, supply. That being said, however, because these power supplies have that feedback and they can tolerate any range from 100 to 127 volts input, that means it should tolerate anything from around 140 volt peak to around like a 210 volt peak on this waveform shape. And that really means that a whole lot of garbage can occur in here and the power supply will still get a clean DC supply regardless. Now how about voltage ripple? Now we're getting to something that actually may cause problems for the power supply. If the voltage sags uh, momentarily too far, it could potentially lead these uh, filter capacitors to drop their voltage below what the power supply switching circuit needs to satisfactorily produce the output. This probably wouldn't be a big problem if the power supply is lightly loaded because these can hold their charge over many, many cycles if there's not a lot of load being drawn. If the power supply is very near to its maximum load, however, these are gonna empty out really fast and having low brownout voltages could be a problem. Now the opposite problem occurs if the ripple goes too high. If we're seeing voltages that are over 210 volts RMS or so, or peak I mean, if you're getting peaks in the 220 or 230 volt range, there's a good chance that you could actually damage the, the switching transistors or the capacitors themselves by allowing the rectified voltage to go too high. Now if this only happens for a very short duration, particularly if the power supply is under high load, it wouldn't be as much of a problem because they're not going to fill up that high in voltage and the NTC thermistor as well as the common mode chokes on the input will serve to limit that inrush to the capacitors and prevent their voltage from rapidly rising in the event of a spike. So basically provided the voltage ripple on average stays at the RMS voltage, it shouldn't really be a big problem, but this is where we start having a little bit more concern when compared to the first two issues.
Now, a third issue we may run into is momentary cutout. This would have a similar problem to the voltage going too low. If those capacitors drain out during this dead time, you'll get low voltage to the output of the power supply, potentially causing it to either shut down or causing problems for the electronics like faulty logic states or latch up. Although in modern systems, this would be relatively unlikely because there are so many watchdog circuits between the power supply and the actual uh, electronic loads that pretty much everything should be taken care of even in the event of a brownout or cutout condition. Now a voltage spike carries a similar problem to the voltage ripple, ripple issue. You get a sudden increase in voltage which could potentially cause damage to the switching elements or the capacitors in this circuit. The rectifier should be rated quite highly in voltage so that shouldn't be a huge problem for it, but something that could be adversely affected are the power factor correction capacitors they could potentially see a punch through because they're right on the front end without any filtering. But as I mentioned for the voltage ripple, the common mode chokes and the, the NTC thermistor should prevent momentary voltage spikes from massively overcharging these capacitors, which should give relatively little problem for the power supply as a whole. And the last thing I'll discuss is brownout. This is basically going to have the same problem as the momentary cutoff and the low voltage rippling in that it's a continuous low voltage that if the power supply is under a lot of load, it may struggle to maintain its output voltage. The only distinction though is brownout would be a continuous low voltage and this may cause the power supply even when unloaded to fail to operate because these capacitors will eventually drain down to that peak voltage. And that of course may cause the power supply to shut down or behave erratically. Here's a reason why you might want to know about what effects low quality power has on switched mode power supplies. This is an old fashioned 3500 watt electric generator with a gas engine on it. And this is important to note because this is not an inverter generator. This is a direct, a direct driven alternator, meaning that all voltage and frequency regulation at the output, as well as voltage stability, are completely at the whim of the engine. If the engine revs, if the RPM increases, then the voltage and frequency will also increase proportionately. If the engine bogs down, the voltage and frequency will drop. Now what, this also, what also can happen is if you have a large load plugged in, the engine will rev it or it will crank up its throttle position and supply that load to keep it at the right frequency and voltage. However, if you suddenly unplug that load, it'll take a minute for the engine to, dis, uh, to close off its throttle valve so during that brief period where the load has been unplugged, you'll get a massive voltage spike. So the bottom line is these are not very good at regulating voltage, frequency, or general stability. Additionally, the alternators in them are notorious for producing kind of asymmetrical and low quality waveform outputs, especially when large loads are applied. So that'll be something else to watch out for. Now this is important to know because in most conditions, it's recommended that for electronic equipment, an inverter generator be used. Inverter generators are somewhat similar to these in that they have an alternator and they have an engine, but the output from the alternator is rectified to DC. The DC is smoothed and filtered and then is re-inverted into a highly controlled, stable AC output. And this is good for electronics because it, it's reliable, it's not subject to voltage spikes, and it's also good for things like, things like motors, which require a very specific voltage and frequency range. Since this is not an inverter generator, it's going to not have any of those benefits. Now, before I tell you why you can use this with switched mode power supplies, let me first just say that all of this is from my own experience and my, based on my own opinions and my own research and should not be taken as an absolute guarantee that a low quality old generator will not damage your high-end equipment. If you're going to plug high-end equipment into an older generator or any non-inverter generator, you're doing so at your own risk and there is always the possibility that the poor quality power will cause problems. But it's my opinion that, I, that these types of generators can be used safely with sensitive electronics equipment and you can get satisfactory results without substantial re reductions in lifespan of the equipment as well. I'll tell you now what the problems are with these generators specifically in terms of the actual operation and I'll tell you what effects that will have on switched mode power supplies.
This is where all the speed regulation on this engine, and therefore the voltage and frequency regulation on the generator, is done. This governor control is controlled by a mechanism inside the engine, and it's designed to set the carburetor's throttle valve such that the output shaft speed will be set to a specific value. In the case of this alternator, the nominal operating frequency or uh, shaft speed is 3600 RPM. That gives you an output of 60 Hertz, that is 60 rotations per second, and the generator is wound such that at that speed, the nominal voltage will be 120 volts. Obviously, that will go up when it's unloaded, and it'll go down when it's under high load, but it should stay ideally within plus or minus 10%. Now this is a pretty old generator, and the carburetor hasn't re been rebuilt in quite a while, so it could be subject to an issue called surging. Surging is the, is the condition where the engine will rev up, the governor will kick in and close off the carburetor, it'll slow down excessively so it'll pop back open again, but it'll get out of, it'll get out of sync and it'll never reach an equilibrium point. Instead, it'll continue to go vroom, vroom, vroom over and over again. And this leads to the condition of unstable voltage, wherein the voltage goes up and down and up and down, and the line frequency changes accordingly. Now, like I said, the switched mode power supplies have internal feedback, so provided that voltage stays within their tolerance from 100 to 120 volts, or in the case of a universal power supply, from 100 to 250 volts, it should be absolutely fine. Of course, that is putting a little bit more load on all of the switching uh, apparatus, having it constantly increase and decrease and increase and decrease its switching power. So you might get a little bit of decrease in lifespan if you do this for a long time. But provided you stay within the tolerance of the input of the power supply, I see no reason why this should be uh, a likely cause of severe damage to the supply. The other big problem I mentioned earlier is if you disconnect a load, this thing will already have been at full throttle or near to full throttle, and it'll suddenly rev up before the governor has a time to close it off. Additionally, the generator is a big inductor, and when you suddenly disconnect a load from an inductor, the voltage spikes momentarily. If that spike is severe enough, it could potentially damage a switched mode power supply, but as I mentioned before, the input filtering as well as the large uh, filter capacitors should keep momentary surges to a minimum effect on the actual DC rail supply voltage to the switching elements. So once again, this is a reason where, why inverter generators would be better, but I don't necessarily think it's cause for concern for operating it either. So now that I've gone over the basics of the concerns about power quality and switch mode power supplies, let's do a bit of a test with a switch mode power supply. So here I have the oscilloscope hooked up, and I also have a 400 watt Centec power inverter connected to a 100 watt light bulb. Now this is a 350 watt power supply, so the light bulb is only going to load it to about 30% capacity. However, this will be a very good test of the performance of the output stage and the feedback, particularly because of the, bul the bulged and damaged capacitors. A power inverter is probably about the most difficult load you could possibly drive with a power supply with damaged capacitors because it constantly draws big pulses of load in order to generate that high frequency switching that steps the voltage up to the higher voltage. So what we're going to do now is we're going to connect it, take the black side here which goes to this wire, and connect it to the ground, get a nut and attach it uh, all the way on here. And we'll attach the positive to the plus 12 volt supply with another nut. So now I've connected the oscilloscope probe leads such that one is connected to the 12 volt output of the power supply and the other is connected to the AC main supply. So now I'm going to plug in the power supply. It's powered on. And now we're going to switch, well now before I switch the inverter on, we'll take a look at this output. You see it's a fairly stable 12 volt output. I'll even put on the measurement. We'll see our RMS on channel one is 12.2 volts and max 12.4 volts. So now what I'm going to do is turn on the inverter, and this is going to put a substantial load on this power supply. So here we go. Waiting for it to kick on. Now the light bulb is on. As you can see, there's a fair bit of ripple, and this corresponds roughly to the switching frequency at the output of the inverter, where it's drawing in large amounts of current. In fact, if I wanted to, I could even go in, turn off channel 2, 
Uh, and then I can switch channel one to an AC couple, like so, and then zoom in my vertical. And that would allow us to see all the noise on this power line. This is obviously reflective of the bad capacitors on this power supply because we're getting all this ripple at the output as a result of the capacitors having a hard time maintaining that stable output. That being said though, the negative feedback in the power supply is good enough to keep that output pretty darn close to 12 volts regardless of the state. So I'll switch the scope back to how I had it before and now we can do some tests. So now I've got a cord running into our test setup and I'm gonna see if I can get this thing to start. Now I haven't run this in like about a year and I, had, I did have the carburetor drained for storage, but it may still have a hard time getting started. So let's give it a go. I'm gonna set the choke, and I'll give it a few pulls with the choke on. Well, that didn't take much. Well, I don't think I've ever had a generator start that easily in one go after being stored for a year. Go figure. Now here's what we want to look into. As you can see on the scope, this waveform is horrendous. It's not a sinusoid at all. It's a triangle wave and it's got a ton of noise on it. I mean, it is just a terrible waveform. Now if we go to our measure, we can see that we're getting roughly 128 volts because we're not loading it at all. And uh, so it is within tolerance of the power supply. Our voltage is okay. Well, it's a volt over, but it'll be fine. But you can see that waveform is terrible. So keep in mind, well, as we said, the actual shape of the waveform does not really matter. It's the Vmax that matters. Vmax is 232, which is pretty high, but I think once we get this loaded down, we're gonna see that this is not as much of a problem for our power supply. The other thing is we're not seeing any major brownouts or major ripples. We're going to change that by actually inducing some surging later on. But first, let's just see how the power supply behaves and see what happens when we start the inverter. So I'll turn the inverter off to begin with, and now we'll just turn on the power supply. Our rail is right up at 12.2, very stable. We'll turn on the inverter. And our light bulb is on. As you can see though, the waveform has changed dramatically. Those sharp clips on the tops and bottoms have turned into a little bit more rounded off outputs because of the rectifier drawing power at the peaks. Our output is just as stable as it was before though, and we're not having any problems here. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go out and intentionally surge the generator to see what happens to the output rail. Now in order for us to see the effects, I'm going to change the time base so that it paints across the screen. Now remember, when you see that voltage drop, and I'll turn off the measure here, when you see this thing get smaller, that means the input voltage has dropped. And when you see it get bigger, it means the input voltage has risen. The yellow line is of course going to then reflect what the output voltage is under load. So I'm going to go rev install and rev install the engine, and let's see what happens to the power output. Now I was keeping a pretty keen eye on it from outside and that output voltage looked pretty darn stable. I mean, we revved that thing way up and down and up and down and that yellow line stayed right where it was. So as you can see, even with a badly surging generator, you're still gonna get reasonable performance out of even a mediocre kind of damaged bad capacitor power supply. Here's another thing I'd like to try. I've got a hair dryer connected to the generator right now I'm going to go disconnect it and see how much the voltage spikes and see if it damages the power supply at all. So I'll be right back. 
I switched it on and off several times, and it had almost no effect on the output voltage. No spiking or any severe surging whatsoever. So that is, of course, uh, the big question. Can you run switch mode power supplies on, uh, on non-inverter generators? And although, of course, I have to tell you for my own liability sake that you shouldn't do that, and it's probably not a good idea, you'd be doing so at your own risk, my opinion and my anecdotal experience is that it will work just fine. So hopefully you learned a little bit about generators, about power quality, and about how switch mode power supplies work. I'll see you on the next video. Thanks for watching.